All right, good evening and welcome to Books and Books. My name is Ketsi and I'm part of the Children's Department here. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us tonight and thanks to our internet audience for tuning in with us. You are all in for an amazing treat tonight and you can keep up with all our events online or for those of you who are here, you can pick up a calendar which is at our register so you can enjoy many more of our author events. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And the handle will be at Books and Books. For those of you online, if you would like to purchase a book and have it personalized by Mr. Dave Barry, call the number on your screen, purchase it, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the US, free shipping. We look forward to from hearing from you. So it's been an amazing treat to have Dave Barry with us this evening. It's been an honor to have him here. It's been wonderful to see how much of a generation he is inspiring and entertaining in his new comical sequel, The Worst Night Ever. But let's have someone from the new generation do the honors. We will have Miss Liv, our honorary and fearless bookseller, introduce Mr. Dave Barry. Hello. When you think about it, worst is a really strong word. If you say something is the worst, you might say it with confidence or in a complaining tone, like, that was the worst hamburger I've ever had. Sometimes, worst is used in a list, like top 10 worst horror films or worst places to stay while traveling in Luxembourg. Come to think of it, often when we say worst, we are just plain exaggerating. But when worst is used in the title of a book by, written by Dave Barry, we know he means it. And what Mr. Barry calls worst usually can't get any worse. <laughs> but before I share my thoughts on Mr. Barry's book series about Wyatt Palmer and his worst adventures, I thought I'd start with a list of the top five worst things I could find online about Mr. Barry. <laughs> All right, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> What I mean by worst is not the fact that he is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and a columnist with over 30 published titles, that he wrote a nationally syndicated humor column for the Miami Herald for 22 years, that there was a sitcom called Dave's World on CBS for four years that was based on him, or that he co-wrote Peter and the Star Catchers, a prequel for Peter Pan that was turned into a Broadway show which I saw in New York when I was a lot younger and really enjoyed, although the crocodile scared me. What I mean is that Dave Barry has had a pretty colorful life, so I'm sharing some of the funniest crayons in his box. The first worst fact about Dave Barry. He went to an elementary school named Wampus. W-A-M-P-U-S. Wampus. You can't spell pus. So <laughs> you can't spell Wampus without pus. Yeah. <laughs> Wampus. Number two, in high school, he was elected class clown, although I guess that turned out to be a good thing. Number three, Mr. Barry wrote a column that mocked Grand Forks, North Dakota, and East Grand Forks, Minnesota, for calling themselves the Grand Cities. In response, Grand Forks named a sewage pumping station after Mr. Barry. <laughs> that made me laugh. Number four, Mr. Barry wrote a book called Boogers Are My Beat and actually got it published. <laughs> and the fifth and final worst fact, Mr. Barry brought national attention to Talk Like a Pirate Day when he responded to an email request that asked him to be its spokesperson. The email that was sent to Mr. Barry said, we've talked like pirates every September 19th and we've encouraged our several friends to. We are dingy sized talk like a pirate kind of guys, but you Dave, you are like a frigate huge sized talk like a pirate kind of guy. <laughs> If you want to know more, you can read about it on talklikeapirate.com. Tonight, Mr. Barry will be discussing his new book, The Worst Night Ever, second in the series of worsts. Mr. Barry's first worst book is called The Worst Class Trip Ever. It was about Wyatt Palmer's class trip to Washington, D.C. and how it went wrong, really wrong. I enjoyed The Worst Class Trip Ever because Wyatt was a narrator and I especially liked his sense of humor. I finished the book the same day I started reading it because the characters were funny, the story had great plot twists, and I couldn't wait to know how it ended. When I was done, I gave the book to my mom and told her to read it. She did, and also really liked the book. 
Yesterday, I was able to get an advanced copy of The Worst Night Ever. But because I had a test today that I needed to study for, I was only able to read the first few chapters. But so far, it's great. <laughs> Wyatt is now an unpopular freshman in high school, not a middle school hero. The most popular boys in school, the Bevan brothers, are also the mean boys and steal his friend Matt's pet ferret. When Wyatt and Matt scheme to get the ferret back, they wind up uncovering the Bevan family's deep, dark secret and learn that there are things much worse than their own popularity issues. And I can't wait to finish this story. Mr. Barry lives in Miami with his family. He walks down the same sidewalks and drives down the same streets that we do. We are really lucky to have him here to write funny and true stuff about Coconut Grove and Florida in his books. I really want to hear what he has to say about his new book, as long as he doesn't give away the ending. Welcome, Mr. Barry. Wow, that, that, that's a terrific introduction. Liv, thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I have sort of a weird uh, presentation to make because I, this is, I haven't really started uh, touring for this book yet. So I have all these slides, that some of which are connected with the last book and some of which are sort of random. And uh, so I will probably skip through some things pretty quickly, uh, try to get to, to the book um, that we're talking about, which is the, the worst night ever. But first, I just want to say I love being here at, the, at Books and Books. This is my favorite bookstore in the world. It's the best bookstore in the United States by far, um, and I'm glad you're here. I hope you come for other events here. They have events here all the time, and they have a good restaurant, and, uh, you, and they sell wine, so. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to come to Books and Books. Um, anyway, so, um, as, as Liv said, this is the second in a series, um, which may only have two books I don't really know. <laughs> I've only written the two. Um, what I, I don't know how many of you have been, have seen me talk before, so I'm going to just kind of quickly go through uh, the random slides that I have at the beginning of this, and we'll, we'll get to this book. But for those of you who don't know me, um, I was a humor columnist for many years, as, as Liv said, and um, I used to do things like, um, I w well, I would basically do anything I could to get a column out of it, including uh, picking my son up at middle school in the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. <laughs> That's my son Rob there. Um, that's me at the, wiener, the wheel of the Wienermobile, uh, picking him up. It was a low day for him. It was a great day for me. Um, <laughs> and that little boy is now a, uh, he's, he's a, first of all, he's a father, so I'm a grandfather. And he's a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. So he recovered from this, at least somewhat, although it took years and years of therapy. Um, so I was doing that for years, writing columns. Then I started writing books. I wrote a book about bad songs. Um, and this is sort of, uh, if you write humor books, um, basically the, the goal of the, the, the publisher is to make you look as stupid as possible on the cover. So I had, I had to pose for a series of photographs. I wrote a book about money, and I thought, well, let's, let's dress Dave up as George Washington on the dollar bill. <laughs> I wrote a book called uh, Dave Barry Hits Below the Beltway, so they thought, well, let's do a boxing theme cover. And so they had me looking like, you know, Mr. Bad Boxer, although if I were a boxer, I would end up looking like the, the back of this book, which is <laughs> that. Um, there were no, no depths to which I would not sink for a, co for a cover picture. Um, I wrote a book called Dave Barry's Not Taking This Sitting Down, and the photographer said, my, his idea was, Dave, I want to get a picture, I'm going to take a toilet and put it in, the, in an intersection in downtown Miami and I want you sitting on the toilet uh, with your pants down, and that's going to be the cover of the book. And I said, the, the publisher will never buy that concept. Um, and <laughs> that was shot on a Sunday morning in downtown Miami, and we didn't, I always assumed that when you did this kind of thing, you got a permit or whatever, and they closed off. But no, he just found an intersection in downtown Miami, waited until the traffic was clear, and put the toilet out there, <laughs> and a police officer showed up. Um, and he, he got out of his car, and I thought, okay, this, we're going to jail now, and the, char the charge will be sitting on a toilet. And, down, and he goes, do you have a permit for this? And we go, no. And he goes, well, then I better, I better stop traffic for you. And so he, he <laughs> was a good Miami police officer. So anyway, along the way, um, 
when I, in the course of writing books, I started meeting other authors. And uh, I ended up in a rock band of authors called the Rock Bottom Remainders, uh, which has some pretty good authors in it, um, including Stephen King and Amy Tan and, and others. Um, we're, we play often at the Miami Book Fair. Uh, that's really kind of where we, we got our, our start. And we've, we've played there many, many years, many different you know, permutations of the band. We're not a good band, and I can prove that. <laughs> I can prove that to you photographically. Here's a picture of us. We're, this is not the Miami Book Fair. The next picture was taken at the Los Angeles Festival of Books, but the band is playing, and you can see the audience reacting to our music. <laughs> but anyway, the, you may recognize the guy on the left there playing the bass. That's Rid Thank you, Ridley Pearson. Uh, Ridley Pearson, is who, our who is actually a good musician, and is our bass player, and is the author of the Kingdom Keepers, Keepers books, which I'm guessing the younger readers here are familiar with. Um, this is before all that. Uh, Ridley and I, he was writing books for grown-ups. I was writing very childish books, but they were for grown-ups. Um, <laughs> and Ridley came to the Miami Book Fair once. This is in, like, whoa, I'm going to say 14 years ago. And he said uh, he was reading Peter Pan, the original Jam Barry Peter Pan, to his daughter, so, uh, Paige. His daughters are named Paige and Story. <laughs> so... But he said, Paige asked him, you know, stopped him and said, how did Peter Pan and Captain Hook meet in the first place? And really thought, wow, that would be kind of a cool idea for a book. How, what's the backstory of Peter Pan? So anyway, the next weekend, he was in Miami. He was staying at my house. We were playing in the, and we're having breakfast one morning. He said, Paige had this question, and I thought it might be a cool book to write. Um, and, I, and he told me about it. I thought, yeah, I said, that's a great idea. You should write that. And he goes, I don't know anything about writing children's books. You know, do you want to help me? So I said, yeah. Um, neither one of us had any idea what we were getting into, but we ended up writing a book called Peter and the Star Catchers. We, we didn't know, we thought it was going to be, we didn't, first of all, we didn't have a publisher, we didn't have, really have anything. We thought it was going to be a short book, and that would be that. It was a, that book was almost 600 pages, and Disney published it, and it did very, very well. And it ended up, in fact, uh, becoming a uh, Broadway play. We ended up writing five books in the series, and that really changed our careers for both of us. Really got much more into, more than I, into writing books for younger readers. And I ended up writing a bu bunch of books, both with him and, and on my own, for younger readers. Um, we had some pretty interesting experiences promoting the Starcatcher series, Ridley and I. We went around the country dozens of times. We went to England, even, promoting that book. Um, one of the most memorable experiences we had promoting that book not that book, but a book in that series happened in this room. Uh, we were standing at that end of the room, and it was mostly young readers. And uh, we were reading, a, as we often did when we talked about our book, we would read an excerpt from it. And we were reading an excerpt that involved an enormous snake and, uh, in a book called the Peter and the Secret of Rundoon. And we used to dress as pirates when we would read our excerpt. So we were, we were over there against that wall, dressed as pirates, reading about this giant snake. What we didn't know is Mitchell Kaplan, who owns this store, knew that, that we were going to read that section and had arranged for a guy to bring a snake to the bookstore. <laughs> because this is Miami. You can get a snake on short notice if you need <laughs> All right. So a guy comes in, a snake wrangler, with a 90-pound, a, a 10-foot-long Burmese python which he, he put on, he came, we didn't see him. He came in that door over there. We're standing there reading to the group. And he came all in and just put the snake on my shoulders. And it kind of crawled across me. And he walked back out of the room because it's a heavy snake. He, did, he was tired of carrying it. This is a picture of that moment. <laughs> this is against this wall over here. The snake is in between us there. It's like clearly trying to decide which one of us it's going to eat. Um, and Ridley and I are trying to look like we're enjoying this. That is a heavy animal, and it's a scary feeling thing. It's much stronger than you are. And um, yeah, what we're really thinking is, you know, did we bring clean underwear um, <laughs> to, this parent, to this? So, so that was one experience we had. Disney published our, our Star Caster series, and it, it in fact published the, 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 the worst uh, class trip and the worst night ever series. Um, and so we did a lot of events at Disney World, and which is been a lot of fun. We've, we've had some really great times. We get to go behind the scenes. We get to go on the, you know, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride when it's closed and walk around and see. It's been a lot of fun. But we've had to do some um, 
like awkward things. We we did a big signing once that involved um, Captain Hook and Peter Pan. <laughs> there we are, all looking very cheerful. Before this event, we were backstage because there was a big crowd there for this, and I don't know where Captain Hook was, but Peter Pan was backstage with us, with Ridley and me. So it's the two of us and that guy, you know, the Peter Pan looking guy. And we're in a little room, we have, we have like 15 minutes to kill. And it's kind of odd, you know, the guy's Peter Pan, you know, you're in a room with Peter Pan. So I'm trying to, you know, break the ice. And I said to him to make small talk, uh, so how do you like working here? And he goes, it's a beautiful day in Neverland. Have you seen Wendy? <laughs> that is exactly what he said. And we're like, no, dude, we haven't seen Wendy. Because <laughs> we're here in a locker room with you. I mean, you know. <laughs> but it turns out that if you are a Disney character, you have to remain. If you're wearing a costume or a uniform, you, know, you must remain a character. So when he's wearing that outfit, he can't do anything or say anything that Peter Pan wouldn't do or say. And it turns out Peter Pan does not have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> So if you want us to talk about a long 15 minutes, try hanging out with Peter Pan um, <laughs> backstage. We also got to be the, um, the, the grand marshals of the Main Street Parade at Disney, Ridley and I. W the bad news was we had to wear uh, ears. But in, in, in this capacity, you've, I'm sure you've all seen the Main Street Parade. It's, the, it's this giant parade of floats that goes through the middle of the Magic Kingdom, and everybody gathers around the parade route to watch it. Um, and... Um, it's led by the Grand Marshal. The, the Grand Marshal rides in the, his antique fire truck at the beginning of the parade. Ridley and I were chosen to do that one day with our family. So we're in this fire truck, and we're waiting behind this giant gate with all these uh, floats behind us. And they said, there's, there's 50,000 people out there waiting for you. They're very excited. This is the big moment. So when they see you coming, make sure you smile and wave because you are leading the parade. You're the, the parade is behind you. So everybody was very excited. So we practice waving in our ears. So they open the gate and send us out, but the, uh, the folk behind us had a mechanical problem. So it, the parade didn't follow us. It was just us going out. And so I don't know if you can see the crowd behind us, but it's not very excited. It's the, the crowd is like, whoa, this is the parade? Two dorks in a fire truck with ears on you? So that, we disappointed everybody in, in the entire uh, uh, Magic Kingdom, which not everybody can say. That. But we've had some pretty cool moments um, because of our book. We got a call uh, once from a woman named Katie Coleman who said that she needed permission to take w w our books, several of our books, on a trip so she could read them to her, her son over Skype. And we didn't at first understand why she needed our permission. And then she explained that, she was an astronaut, and she was taking our books to the, uh, the International Space Station. So that's Katie Coleman uh, reading a book we wrote called Science Fair uh, to her son back on Earth. Um, and uh, Ridley and I both got calls from her from the space station to thank us for uh, letting her use her bo our book, although we were thrilled to do it. Um, I, I got, we were both at restaurants, as it happened, when the calls came. Um, guess what restaurant I was at when I got a call from the International Space Station? Never mind, I'll tell you. <laughs> Johnny Rockets. <laughs> and I just have to mention, one of the reasons I like writing uh, books for younger readers is, is the reaction you get for the response you get. This book, it's called Science Fair. It's got the, my favorite all-time fan letter, which I'll, I'll just read an excerpt from, from two young men. Dear Dave and Ridley, both of us think that your book, Science Fair, is one of the awesomest books out there. Just to warn you, two authors that our book club has written to have died. <laughs> uh, we hope that the curse skips you. And <laughs> my favorite is the, 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 the PS to that, which is such, such a kid thing. PS, for most of this letter, we alternated writing three words at a time. So anyway, that brings us up to the, uh, after, after working with Ridley, um, I took a couple years off just writing adult books, and I started writing young adult fiction again. And the first book I wrote was called The Worst Class Trip Ever. Um, anybody, has anybody here read The Worst Class Trip Ever? Just so I know where I'm, oh, okay, great. That's fantastic. Um, I'm happy to see that. Um, 
I will quickly move through it. I'm not going to give away the plot or anything. Um, but it involves a, a, a young man named Wyatt Palmer who is in the eighth grade at a school right here in Miami. Um, the book's set in Miami. Um, and they, are on a, they go on a class trip. And the inspiration for this was my daughter, who also goes, goes, she goes to public schools here in Miami. Uh, when she was in middle school, I was a chaperone on a class trip. And I thought, wow, a lot of things could go wrong <laughs> with people like me in charge. So anyway, that's a good audience there. <laughs> that's an excellent laugh, really. I'm just going to take that kid around with me everywhere I go. You know, <laughs> my personal laugh track. So anyway, they go. this class trip goes to Washington, D.C., and these kids, Wyatt Palmer and his friends, figure out something is going on. It starts on the flight. They, they meet some, some suspicious guys. Some weird things start to happen. They begin to suspect that there's going to be an attack on the White House involving giant kites, which is... <laughs> Believe it or not, a, a, I, I, I believe it's an actually uh, uh, viable way you could attack the White House. Don't tell the White House. No. And so I, I, I wrote about this. I mean, I created this plot involving these kites in the White House. Um, and and the, the kids in the end go around to various uh, monuments and, and places in Washington, D.C. And one of them that I had to include, it's one of my, it, I find this to be the strangest thing in Washington, D.C. And I put it in the book. It's, a, it's called the Boy Scout Monument, and it's a real thing. It's a gigantic real thing, the Boy Scout Monument. And I'll just show it to you. I uh, include it in the book. I'll show it to you, and then we'll, listen, and, and we'll analyze what disturbs us about it. Okay. Uh, this doesn't work. Okay. Well, so we got, a, we got a Boy Scout. That makes sense. It's a Boy Scout Monument. We got that lady on the right. I don't know what the, her deal is, but the, what about the giant naked man? <laughs> what is he doing in the boy? So anyway, I, I've yet to read a, a, a coherent explanation of why this is the Boy Scout monument, but it is for now, and I urge you to go see it when you get a chance. So anyway, so that moves us to, well, okay, the worst class, that was the worst class trip ever. This is the new one. It's called The Worst Night Ever. Same kids are in this, Wyatt Palmer and his friends. Almost all the characters that are from the first book are in this book and some new ones. Um, but they have now moved ahead a year. They were in eighth grade for the previous book. Now they're in ninth grade, which means they have now moved to high school. They were the big kids in their middle school. Now they're the little kids in high school. And everybody who's been through that knows that's a big deal. That's quite a change. Um, I especially know that you're very vulnerable when you're a young man and you get into high school, especially if you look like a really young person, which is, was my curse when I was in high school. And just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from when I wrote this book, that's my high school yearbook photo. <laughs> I was in, tw yeah, I was in 12, that's as good as I could look. <laughs> I wish you weren't laughing quite so hard at that, but. <laughs> no, so that, that, was me in, that was me in 12th grade. So you can imagine what I look like in ninth grade. Like, I look like I was four. Um, so I, the, the, anyway, Wyatt Palmer, who is um, my alter ego, is still the hero. He's still the protagonist. Uh, he's, in, he's in high school. And um, it's, it's rough. It's tough. I mean, it's a big high school. Uh, I'm not saying it's patterned after the high school my daughter goes to, which has 3,200 kids. But it is patterned after that in high school. There's a lot of kids there. It's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of, and it's tough to be a young young kid in, in that situation. As it happens, Matt has a, I mean, uh, Wyatt has a friend named Matt who was in the first book, uh, who who tends to get Wyatt in trouble, and um, Wyatt's Wyatt's friend Matt is not the brightest. Well, he's he's a perfectly perfectly bright person, but he does stupid things. And one of the things he does at the beginning of this book is he brings his pet ferret to school. There's the ferret. There is a ferret. We'll let that represent uh, Matt's ferret. Um, this this ferret falls into the hands of a couple of bullies in the school. We call them the called the Bevan brothers. Very very early in the book, the Bevan brothers steal that ferret basically from Matt in in school, and um, this is bad because they are kind of obnoxious guys. And it and it happens that they have in their house 
a Burmese python, a, a reticulated python. It's a very large snake. Here is a version. Okay, that's not the exact snake I had in mind, but it's a big snake. Um, it's called a reticulated python because its jaws can open up extremely wide to, to ingest whatever prey it wants to. This thing can swallow a very, very large animal, much larger than its jaws. Uh, this is one eating, uh, it's eating an antelope, okay? That is its mouth. It's opened up super, super wide. So clearly this is not gonna have a lot of trouble with the ferret. Um, so our guys, they're, they're not the bravest people in the world, they're not the smartest people in the world, but they decide they have to rescue this ferret. And that's what the book really begins with their effort to go get the ferret back. So they go over to the house of these people, these kids, the Bevan brothers. They, 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 their, their dad is very wealthy, lives in a big estate. I'm not saying it's based on cocoa plum, <laughs> but it is based on cocoa plum. They get over there, and they discover that there's some weird things going on. They sneak in, and um, I, I'm going to keep it vague here because a lot of things happen in the plot. But they sneak in, and they discover that there's some strange things going on over at this guy's house this man's house, besides the fact that there's a gigantic snake over there, uh, there's an animal they see some men wrestling with, trying to deal with it, get, getting it out of a crate, trying to put it into a cage. This is the animal. Does anybody know what that is? Any kids? Yeah. It's a Komodo dragon, which is a, it's the world's largest reptile. It can get to be 10 feet long, 300 pounds. It can be very aggressive. It has a, uh, whoop. Okay. It has a venomous um, bite. Um, so that w what it can do is, even if it can't catch you, and it's pretty fast, it'll, if it bites an animal, the animal eventually gets sick and dies, and this, this thing will, will track it down. So it's a big, scary animal. And they, for some reason, they have it there. You're not supposed to have these in the United States if you're not a zoo or some kind of professional researcher. But they have one at this people's house. And in doing the research for this book, what I found was um, there's a gigantic market for illegal, dangerous animals. There are a lot of people who love to have dangerous animals. And guess where a lot of these people live? <laughs> right here in Miami. This is, this is the national and one of the world headquarters of this particular industry of Im illegally importing large, dangerous animals. So anyway, this guy has, has a, um, a Komodo dragon, which are, they're, they're very, they're, they'll eat almost anything. This is one eating a deer. And you know they get them various ways. They'll find them dead or they'll, they'll try to kill them if they can. But they will track down and kill pretty large animals. Um, they don't usually kill people, but they have been known to. Uh, and they're also very social. They like to dance, as we can see in this picture. <laughs> now, those are two males, uh, Komodo dragons, fighting. Um, so anyway, these kids discover this. Why in the world would this guy who lives in Coco Plum, although it's not, you know, we're not going to say it's Coco Plum, <laughs> why would he have a Komodo dragon you know, what's going on over there? And then through a ver a ver various means, they begin to discover that there are other animals over there in this guy's house. Uh, animals that shouldn't be there, animals that really shouldn't be in, in anybody's possession who's not a zoo or a professional researcher. Uh, this animal is called a black mamba. It's a very dangerous snake. It's the world's most venomous snake. Two drops from its venom can kill you, but they're, they're, they're very aggressive, they're very fast, they get to be 10 feet long. Extremely dangerous snake, completely illegal to have this snake. So naturally, a lot of people want to have one. Um, <laughs> this guy has one. This is called a death stalker scorpion, most venomous scorpion in the world. This lady doesn't even want to look at it. <laughs> this is only a picture of it, though. It can't hurt you. I have a real one right here. Wait, let me, no. So he has, for some reason, this guy has a death stalker scorpion. He also has this thing. Does anybody know what that is? It's not a tarantula, it's called a, it's called a, a wandering spider, or a banana, Brazilian wandering spider, banana spider. It's the most venomous spider on earth. He, this guy has one of these. Why would he have one of these? And then he has this. And this may not look like a dangerous, particularly dangerous animal. It's called a siafu, or driver ant, African driver ant. Um, and I'm going to read to you the section of the book where, where this ant comes up. These kids have discovered this is there. They're talking to a federal wildlife agent who is an undercover agent who's been trying to figure out how this smuggling has been going on. And he's explaining to them why this ant is dangerous. 
the kids are talking to him. What's so scary about an ant, says Taylor? Well, if there's just one, it's not that scary, although they do have extremely powerful jaws, so even one can give you a, a pl pretty pl painful bite. But the thing about Siapu is there's never just one. They form the biggest ant colonies in the world, sometimes 20 million ants, 20 million. And they work together, so they're like one big creature that has millions of jaws. They're swarm raiders, which means they go out and hunt for food in a huge mass, like a river of ants. They eat pretty much any animal in their path. Usually that's other insects, earthworms, rodents, stuff like that. But they've been known to kill cattle. You mean like a cow, said Taylor? Ants could kill a cow? It happens, especially if the cow has been tied up and can't run. Goats and dogs, too. The ants look for openings so they can go into the animal's mouth and nose. Thousands and thousands of them filling up the airway so the animal can't breathe. It dies from as asphyxiation, then the ants tear it apart. Ooh, said Taylor. Can they kill people, I said. If you can walk, you can get away from them, he said. If you can't walk, say you broke your leg and you're lying on the ground, or for some reason you're unconscious. If the Siafu get to you, he shook his head. It's a very, very unpleasant way to die. So the kids have now figured out that something's going on at this place. Unfortunately, nobody believes them. This guy is a very responsible person. Why would he have these animals? It seems very strange. It especially seems strange that he would have these ants. Usually the people who collect dangerous animals like to observe them. They like to watch them eat. If you, you have a snake, you can feed it, you can see it eat. These ants, you can't see them eat. I mean, if you open the box they're in, they're going to come out and get you. So why would he have them? The kids start to explore this mystery, and it leads them, believe it or not, to Zoo Miami. <laughs> and I, I will want to just stress that nothing in this book would ever really happen at Zoo Miami, especially not the scene <laughs> that takes place at Zoo Miami. Um, but in research, researching this book, I did uh, employ uh, Ron McGill, who's the, you know, I, I asked Ron a couple of questions. He's probably going to deeply regret that he ever answered them. Um, so they realize that something's going on at Zoo Miami, and it happens that the night that it's going to go on is Halloween. Um, so basically, you've got these animals, these kids, the zoo and Halloween all coming together, and that's basically what sets up the action um, in the book. So that's the book. Um, and now I'll have uh, Liv come up and give the introduction again. <laughs> no. Now I've, I'll, I'll take your questions. Anybody? About anything. Yes, Liv. Do you let anybody in your family read it before you show it to the editor? Do I let anybody in the family read it before I show it to the editor? Um, I don't think anybody in my family wants to read it. <laughs> uh, my wife's a sports writer, so she's busy writing her own stuff. Um, and my daughter, God, you know, she's my daughter. She would never read anything I wrote, although I did dedicate this book to her, so now she has to. Um, I will sometimes ask my wife if I've written something that I want to be funny, and I'm not sure if it's funny, to read it, to tell me if it's funny. But I've learned that she always says it's funny anyway because she's my wife. And she's, but this kind of stuff, no. I pretty much, say, you know, I, I mull over it and mull over it, and then I send it to the, uh, send it into the editor. And you know, if they have questions, then I deal with them then. Yeah. So you had a period of time where you were doing adults books, and then you went back to children's books. What inspires you to go one direction or the other? Um, I like doing both, and so this is the book that I have coming out now in uh, September. I have an adult book coming out. It's called The Best State Ever, and it's a defense of Florida. <laughs> I went around to places all over Florida and wrote about it, um, you know, because we are kind of a laughing stock of not just the nation but the world. Um, and so I'm defending Florida in that book. I don't know. I just like to do both. I love writing books for kids. Uh, kids are the best. They're the best readers. They really are. They like what you wrote. They don't fake it, you know. They like it. They they lo read it. They don't like it. They don't read it. Um, but they're they're just great readers. Uh, I like writing for adults because I think of myself as an adult, um, <laughs> but not everybody does. Yeah. On the title, I mean, on the cover, why is there a horse with pants and a man with? Okay. Why is there a horse with pants and a man? There is a horse. There he is. Horse head. That's actually the head of a horse on a person. See, there's his legs. And there's the other half of the horse. It's a horse costume that get divided into two. To understand why there's a horse riding a motor scooter through Miami, you have to read the book. 
But trust me, it makes perfect sense when you do. Uh, although I do not recommend anybody drive anywhere in Miami wearing a horse head or in jet pack. I would just shorten that sentence. Don't drive anywhere in Miami. It's probably <laughs> the simplest way to put it. Yeah. Yes, sir. When you were with Riley Pearson, um, did he say anything about the Kingdom Keepers? When I was with Ridley, did he say anything about the king? Yeah, I mean, Ridley writes about the kingdom, talks about the kingdom keepers all the time. And he, as you, you've read the kingdom keepers? So uh, I'm on the second. Okay, book. well, he researches the heck out of those books. I mean, he goes to the Magic Kingdom, and he, and I got to tag along with him. And we, we, we went on all these rides after they were closed. We got all these special tours. We went under Disney, where there's, you know, all these tunnels underneath there. And it's been a lot of fun. He's really, really into Disney, Ridley is. Um, no, believe it or not, he had that idea first, the Kingdom Keepers idea first. And he was, so he already kind of was talking to Disney about that. Then he had the idea about Peter Pan. And when he told them about that, they said, well, do that one first. And so he, he and I ended up writing these five books together about Peter Pan. Then he went back and started doing the Kingdom Keepers, and he's done, I don't know how many since then, but he's, he's uh, does, a, does a lot of them. So you have a lot of reading ahead of you. Of Kingdom Keepers, yeah. yeah. Um, this one reminded me, we saw Ridley Pearson here, and he talked about how you guys went to Moscow on an exchange. Yes. And then he started saying something about a Mexican restaurant, oh my, okay. and he said, well, that's Dave Barry's story to tell. So. All right, I will just try to summarize this. Uh, Ridley and I, were chosen by the State Department to go to Russia as part of a program designed. They sent authors over there to improve relations between the, the two countries. Well, we see how well that has worked out. Um, uh, relations are not good between the two countries. And, um, but we went over there, uh, and it was very interesting. They, the State Department gave us this thick packet of uh, warnings that said they are going to, they're going to, First of all, if you use the phone, they're going to they're gonna be listening to you. Your, your hotel room will probably be bugged. Um, your computer will probably be hacked, or at least they'll try. Uh, you, will be ha you may be hassled on the street um, by, you know, people saying that they're officials, whatever. All of that happened to us. I mean, yeah. The, we, it still was a great trip. I mean, we really enjoyed it, although... Um, it was a little difficult for me because we were doing these talks to li library groups, and you know, often we had to speak through interpreters, and it, and it's, it's hard to explain humor through an interpreter. You know, and I'm trying to explain what I do, and they don't have anybody who does what I do in Russia. You know, so and I had my I had some slides. I would show them the, the picture of the uh, uh, me picking up my son in the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, and um, and they don't have the Wienermobile in in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be looking at it like, and I'm trying to say, this is funny. I picked them up in the winter. And they're like, look at it. I can think, and I can see what they're, they're like. They say, how the heck did we lose the Cold War to these people, you know? <laughs> but um, so anyway, what I learned, the, the, the big lesson I learned, uh, which Ridley was referring to, was um, if you go to Russia, don't eat the Mexican food. Um, we, one night, we, after our event, we, we got back and it was late, and the only restaurant nearby our hotel was a Mexican restaurant run by Russians. And, and they're not that good at Russian food, uh, let alone Mexican food. And I ate what I later realized was a weaponized chimichanga. <laughs> and I don't want to get too explicit here with young people in the room, but if there was somebody listening in on my hotel room that night, that, that person will need years of therapy. Um, um, so, but... Yeah, that was fascinating. Though. With the, and the, the Russian, they were great. The people were great. They, they, their government hates our government, and they, you know, they, that's all they hear all day long, on their TVs. You know, we're bad. They're good. You know, this was when the UK, Ukraine crisis was going on a lot, and all the newscasts all day long were anti-American. So they, they're getting a steady diet of that. Um, but the people, they were pretty cool. You know. Yeah. Right. Um, what really got me started, uh, my wife Michelle, she's right there, Michelle and I, we, we went, um, 
we, we were chaperones on a class trip. Our daughter had a class trip. We went, we were chaperones, and nothing really terrible happened on our trip, but it could have. <laughs> I realized, like, you know, when, when kids are on a class trip and with amateurs like myself in, you know, positions of responsibility, things could go really wrong. So that just got my, me thinking about, you know, what would be, you know, that could be a, because the, the whole idea with fiction is you get people in trouble, and then you get them out of trouble. And so this would be an opportunity to get in trouble. Um, and then um, I used this boy, Wyatt Palmer, because he was me. Like, you know, that was me when I was that age. I, you know, I was in love with girls who would never in a million years be in love with me. And, you know, I wasn't that good at anything particular, you know, but I, I was kind of a wise ass, you know. So, um, so that, you know, just they took those two ideas, put them together, and then it's just a question of thinking of what kind of trouble specifically to get them in and how to get them out of it. Um, so it was like that. Any other? Yeah. How did you write theater and the star catchers? Did you? How did you divide the writing? Or well, first the, the, we first outlined the books, um, and that was difficult for me because the the ten, your temptation is to just start writing always, but especially with there's there's two of you, you really kind of have to know where you're going to go, and then we 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 broke it up by characters. Um, not by, you know, not every other chapter, but I had the younger, the kids, most of the kids were my characters. Most of the, like, the bad guy pirates were Ridley's characters. Ridley's an evil human being. He's a psychopath. <laughs> I'm just, he really is. And we're glad he has a healthy outlet for it. But he'd be killing people if he weren't writing books about killing people. <laughs> so, um, so when, when it was your turn, when it was your, you know, like you knew kind of where it had to go, okay, the boat has to go from here to here, and then they have to have this happen. But that's all you knew. So you'd write your chapter and send it to the other guy, and then he could change anything he wanted. And it was all email. Uh, anything he wanted, send it back. And then you could change anything back you wanted, send it back. You didn't have to explain it. You just change it. We call it ping pong, you know. And it went back and forth, back and forth, till we agreed on it. Uh, and we got better at it as, as time went by. But that is not how most people do it. I mean, usually there's, you know, if, if you send an, a manuscript to an editor in New York, every single change they make, they write a little explanation in the margin, you know. It's like, we didn't do that. We just changed it, you know. So. Um, and we remained friends throughout that process, which was amazing. You have to trust the other person to do it. And it worked. We did five books that way. Well, actually, more than five, but five in the Starcatcher series. So it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, how long did you write this book? How long did it take me to write? About 27 minutes. <laughs> and I, that was like including a sandwich. Now, uh, people always want to know how long. I, um, I want to say it maybe took maybe six months. You know, And if I didn't do anything but write it, it would have taken me maybe three months. I mean, it takes a while. Um, there are authors who take years and years and years to write books, but I think those authors are mostly just sitting around. Uh, <laughs> I think you, you can write a book. You can, you can write almost any book in a year if you, that's what you're doing. Um, the, are you, Ketsia, are you telling me something? Ke yeah, you are. This is Ketsia. She runs this place. No? No. Yeah. Okay, who? Yeah, where? Right in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Every single time I see her hand. I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, I grew up no, I'm going to take this question. Yeah, go. I grew up, I grew up Thank you. I sound, I sound like radiation. <laughs> well, thank you. That makes me feel very old, but I appreciate it. I was a teenager reading your column. Yeah, well, I was a teenager when I wrote them. So. <laughs> Um, I, I really honestly cannot answer that question. Um, you know, Mike Royko, who was one of my favorite columnists, um, he used to, the, the question, they used to ask him, what's your favorite column? And he, his answer was always the last one, because it's done. You know, that's kind of how I feel. You, you, I think that um, there are people who, like, they get really attached to a book they've written or a, something they've written. But it, I, I come from the newspaper tradition. News, I wrote thousands of columns. And um, I think your, your tendency is to say, finished, now what's the next one? Rather than to look back and, and bask in it. And uh, you know, there are books that I really like that I wrote, and there are books that I think I could have done better, but I don't have a favorite. I just, you know, I, I like to think, I'll, I'll write another one, and that one will be even better. And that's the way I think. 
Yeah. Liv. You know, there's a nightclub named after you. <laughs> Michelle and I, for my, the Florida book, one of the places we did, we went to, Michelle and I got into Liv. We were like, by at least 300 years, the oldest people <laughs> in there. Yeah. I embarrassed Michelle because um, I, I tried to dance the twist and the mashed potatoes on the dance floor. It's nobody does at Liv, trust me when I say. She made me stop. Any advice to, uh, to kids who want to write humor? Yeah, um, do it. You know, write it, write humor. Write it as much as you can. Don't, don't try to copy somebody else. Don't, you know, don't worry about whether you're doing it right or wrong. Just write it, you know, what you think is funny and keep practicing it. I mean, I've, I've been writing humor since I was your age. Um, and. I'm sure most of it was terrible, you know, but, you know, I kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. You get better and you get better and you get better. And the main thing is don't try to copy anybody. I, you know, I think that's the, the big temptation with humor is to try to write like somebody else. It's kind of hard not to, I guess, at the beginning. But, you know, you just don't, don't count on somebody else's opinion. You, you think it's funny, you know, hope that other people will and keep going. And, you, you know, you get better at presenting what you think is funny. And if you're funny, eventually people will figure that out and they'll agree with you. You're not funny, though, Liv. Don't worry. No, you're actually very funny. Yes, go ahead. What did you study in college? Did you study writing? <sighs> Unfortunately, I went to college in the 60s. So study study is not the word I would. No, yeah, I, I majored in English. I was an English major. Um, so I, I read a lot of good literature. I wrote a lot of, of really stupid papers. <laughs> but I did write a lot. I wrote for my college paper, wrote humor for the, the paper, played in a rock band also. That was equally important in my life back in the 60s. Um, but I did, I did major in English. And we have many great English teachers, including Miss Senior is here somewhere. There she is. That's <laughs> Miss Senior was my daughter's English teacher at Carver Element, at Carver Middle School. And, and that's a great school. Yeah, no, you'll already ask, go ahead, you can ask one more. Yes, it's a little scary that you know that, but the band I was in, the band I was in in college was called the Federal Duck. I don't know that I can tell that story. Um, I'll try. Okay, well the the best I can do that. There was a duck pond at Haverford. I went to Haverford College. Haverford College. Our motto was "We never heard of you either," uh, and. One night at the duck pond, some, my roommates and I were sitting there, and a bunch of ducks started coming toward us. And my roommate, Bob Stern, became convinced that these ducks were federal agents. They were working for the federal government. And if you don't know why that was, then you were not there in the 60s. Is all I, I, I really I can't be any more specific about the federal duck. But we were actually a pretty good band. We were a lot better than the rem remainders. Most of the guys in that band ended up playing professional professionally for a while, and then they all ended up being dentists and lawyers, but <laughs> they're pretty good. Uh, not me. I, I was terrible, so I just went right into writing, which, which worked out much better for me. Ketsia, how are we on time? Okay. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a great question. That's the best feeling in the world. I can remember how I felt when my first book got published. This was so exciting. To just have this book with my name on it, um, and I can I can also remember when I saw my first um, newspaper story appeared, you know, in a real newspaper, the Daily Local News in Westchester, Pennsylvania. You know, um, it's a great, great feeling. It never totally goes away, but it's it's really exciting the first time it happens. Yeah. No. <laughs> I've been, re I've, no, it really hasn't happened to me. I've been very, very lucky in that from the first book I wrote, the publisher already wanted it before I wrote it. They already said, please write a book about X. Um, and so that, and, and, and believe me, it's not easy to write about X, um, but I did it. No. Y is not, also not any, no. Uh, no, I, I've always sort of like written a book that was already, the publisher already agreed to, that they wanted. Um, 
But the, what you're talking about being rejected is the much more common experience. Um, and it, it didn't happen to me because I didn't start till late. I mean, I was already an established columnist when I started writing books. So they already knew who I was, they knew what they wanted and so on. If you're starting out uh, just, just out of college writing books, it's much more likely that you will be rejected. Um, and it's difficult, and it is a big part of the writing experience for many, many people, especially novelists. Uh, you just sort of have to get through it. And usually the re they're right to reject you. Usually it's the first one isn't that good, the second one isn't that good. Uh, Ridley Pearson wrote, I don't know how many books before he finally got published. He just stuck to it. And most of the people who make it as writers is what they just keep writing until somebody wants to publish it. Not, not a normal experience to have a, write a book and, and they publish it and suddenly you're a bestseller. That doesn't happen very often. You have to be persistent. Oh, wait, which? Facing reject all those columns. Oh, yeah, there. well, when I, when I started writing my column, this is my wife correcting me. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, my wife is also the only person who knows where my Pulitzer Prize is, because I don't. Right? Um, yeah, that's true. When I started writing um, columns for a little paper, um, I tried to get it syndicated. I would send it around to uh, bigger papers. And they would all say, well, we think it's funny, but it's not for our readers. I got that a lot. Um, you know, and, and then it was only when finally when a couple of big papers just did it, ran it, and the readers did like it. Uh, readers are always smarter than editors think they are. That's been my experience in life. Um, then, you know, every, then all of a sudden, oh, it was okay. Bah! Everybody was okay with publishing um, my stuff. But anyway, thank you for correcting me, Michelle. <laughs> in front of everybody. Yeah, way back there. One more. What is the best practical joke that's ever been played on you and or you played on someone else? Uh, I'll try to keep this story fairly short. It's, I don't know if this qualifies as a practical joke, but it was, it was something I didn't expect. Impractical. Well, it, it was when in, in 1988, um, my editors at the Miami Herald, the Trop Magazine, uh, Gene Weingarten and Tom Schroeder, told me I had to come in for a meeting. and um, I said, I can't. I'm going to Key West today. And they said, no, you have to come in. You know, Janet Chusmer, the editor, wants you in here. And I hate meetings. And I never went to the Herald. So, but they said, you have to go. So I, um, I take my son, Rob, who is then uh, seven years old. We go into the Herald. And R Rob is very excited to go to Key West, because when we go to Key West, we used to rent a motor scooter. And he would ride on the back. And we'd just spend the whole weekend riding around Key West. And he loved that. It was this big thing. So we get, the, we get there to the Herald, and the, the whole newsroom is packed. And um, they tell me that they're about to announce the winners of the Pulitzer Prizes. And you know, I just assumed this didn't have anything to do with me. And I said to Rob, this is cool. You're going to see they're going to announce the Pulitzer winners. And evidently, the Herald won a Pulitzer Prize for something. Um, well, it turns out that there were two Pulitzers. One was a photographer named Michael Ducille, and one was from me for commentary. But I didn't know that. They had kept that from me. And about 30 seconds before they announced the winner, the winners, a, an editor came up to me and said, congratulations. And, so, and I was like, my god, I'm about to win a Pulitzer Prize here. And that's the first thing I thought. The second thing I thought was, like, we're not going to Key West. <laughs> because you know, there's all this stuff that's going to happen. So I, I turned turn on my son, Rob, who's seven, and say, Rob, we're not going to Key West this weekend. And he's like, just face just fell. And I said, but I'll buy you a Nintendo. See, he, he really, really wanted a Nintendo, and I've been saying, no, not till your birthday, you know. So he goes, really? Oh, yeah, and he jumps up into my arms and hugs me. He's so happy. At that moment, they announce that I've won a Pulitzer Prize, and they take my picture. And the next day's Herald, the front page picture, was um, Rob with his arms around my neck, beaming, his Barry, you know, two Herald staffers win Pulitzer Prize. And the, the picture of me was Rob with his arms around my neck with this huge smile on his face. And all my friends said, that was so great how happy Rob was <laughs> that you won a Pulitzer Prize. But in fact, he had no idea what a Pulitzer Prize was. <laughs> but just to complete the anecdote, last year, the Wall Street Journal, where Rob works, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize. And Rob was one of the team that won it. So that little guy grew up and you know, they didn't, now he knows what a Pulitzer is. So <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all for coming. Ketsia, live. Great introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> right.
All right, thank you all for coming. Those of you are, are internet watch, uh, the internet audience that's watching, if you'd like uh, Mr. Barry to personalize the book, just call the number on your screen and we'll be able to get that for you. Thank you all for coming and let's give another loud books and books. Books and books. Books and books. <laughs> thank you and have a good night. <laughs>